Okay, so uh, welcome to this session. And uh, it's a session about um, how we moved from watersheds to sewer sheds. And um, it's uh, really a story about the Next Generation Solutions Project and how we responded to a global pandemic. So this session is uh, chaired by myself and John Giese from the University of Saskatchewan. And we've been working together under the Global Water Futures for uh, the last few years. So I'd like to give just a, an, I'd like everybody to just take a, a moment um, as beginning to acknowledge um, that uh, we live and work on the traditional territories of the neutral Anishinaabe and uh, Haudenosaunee peoples. Um, it's also the Haldeman track that was promised to the six nations on six miles on either side of the Grand River. And in Saskatoon, it's the lands of the Treaty 6, um, traditional territories of the Cree and the homeland of the Métis. Uh, we need to make real efforts towards re um, reconciliation, reconciliation. And we need to consider for a moment how each of us is going to make a difference going forward in the areas and lands that we live on. So, this story we're gonna tell on the next hour and a half is about how we pivoted as a bunch of fish biologists and ecotoxicologists towards addressing the needs of a global pandemic. Uh, we were working uh, through the global water futures on environmental DNA. We were trying to detect DNA as it's shed into the environment and trying to assess biological communities. So, we were also doing work on a variety of projects related to trace analysis and molecular biology tools. So our labs were very well established in trying to be able to understand environmental assessment and effects in uh, watersheds. And we were particularly, uh, at least in Waterloo and, and in Saskatoon looking at wastewaters. So we were in a very unique position because we had all of the skills and the partnerships needed to detect SARS-CoV-2 viral fragments in wastewater when the pandemic originally started. And so we wanted to see if we could make a contribution. The, when, when, you, uh, when you sneeze and cough and you have SARS, you, you spread it to other people, but you also discharge it into the wastewater. It's released into the environment it gets inactivated, it gets broken down as it moves through the sewers, and eventually we can detect it as it disperses into the influent of sewage treatment plants or into the sewer shed in whatever form. So if we sample here in the sewer shed, <clears throat> we can get a very good idea or a good sample of all of the people that have made a contribution to that sample in that sewer shed. So we can do surveillance um, across these watersheds. So essentially we're gonna switch from watersheds to sewer sheds. So everybody poops, everybody makes a contribution. Samples, uh, wastewater samples the whole community, potentially a few people up to millions of people. It includes individuals, whether they're symptomatic or asymptomatic, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter what group you're in or equity, whether you're getting tested or not tested. It's independent of how the clinical testing is occurring and the protocols and biases that are associated with that. So it creates an alternate tool for public health surveillance. And it's, uh, it's independently tracking trends in a community that can be used to support and understand what's going on in that community in terms of the COVID-19 infections. And potentially it could be an early warning in some situations. So where were we a year ago, May 17th, 2020? Um, the parliament was shut down and we had around 77,000 total cases in Canada. As of yesterday, we had 72,000 active cases in Canada. So we weren't expecting um, this uh, a, a remarkable um, a series of waves at, the, at that time. But we uh, had all these tools. So we started going, preparing back in April and we returned back into the laboratory and we started developing methods so that we could approach and try to do some of this work. We ran into all kinds of challenges. There was the safety associated with COVID-19 um, uh, with a, a deal working with the virus. We had to install uh, our biosafety 
uh, apparatus. We had to have safety plants. But we ran into problems. We didn't have uh, availability of supplies. We basically had to develop methods that worked with the things we had in the laboratory. We had limited resources in terms of human resources, and we had minimal internal external supports. It was very difficult to order things uh, and get supplies, and we had no targeted funding. But we decided that uh, talking with GWF, um, that we could divert some of our resources to try to start to address this um, you know, urgent national need. So within the Next Generation Solutions, uh, Next Generation Solutions project, uh, we started working towards being able to analyze for the virus. And then we got support from the Lake Futures project, we got support from the Wastewater project, and from the core technical team, where we were able to use the resources that we had to be able to pivot very, very quickly towards um, analyzing virus in the wastewater and supporting our public health. Um, we developed the methods. Uh, each of the labs has developed slightly different methods um, that fit with the apparatus and the equipment that we had available to us. But essentially, measuring things in sewage is much more complex than trying to me measure it in a nasal swab. So it took a lot more work to be able to concentrate and extract and clean up those samples so that we could detect them using qPCR. One of the key things is we, as we developed our methods, we were reporting to our partners. And we were fortunate to have some very engaged partners um, in uh, Saskatoon, in Waterloo, York, Peel, um, who were uh, taking the data every single week, starting um, almost 40 weeks ago now. Uh, we report to them every week, if sometimes uh, more than that, sometimes even daily. And uh, we were, they were using that information to support the interpretation of what was going on in their particular regions. And so the noble, mobile, my knowledge mobilization was extremely important um, and it was very, very complex and took a lot, a lot, a lot of work, but it was co-creation, it was data sharing, and it was built on trust. Um, and at one point, we were even reporting to the science table on a daily basis as the beginning of the third wave started. Um, it was also a whole group of peoples, uh, people that were working in public health agency in Ontario. It's a massive program that's been developed now as well. And we've been supporting those programs as they've been getting up and going uh, because we were some of the early uh, adopters of this technology. Um, so we developed a service surveillance program with uh, several municipalities and we're supporting public health action. We participate in open collaborative efforts. We've established rapid turnaround and reporting. Uh, we've shared our methods uh, openly. It has been one of the most collaborative experiences of my career. Uh, we put the information openly on dashboards in, in weekly epi reports of the municipalities. And we're now working towards contributing to the detection of variants of concern. So the following talks that we're going to have are um, going to emphasize some of the complexity and some of the impact that this program has had over the last year. And I will stop sharing now. And I'm going to turn it over to John. So John Giese from uh, University of Saskatchewan. <clears throat> there we go. Okay, anyway, my computer is saying we have low system resources. So we'll I'll hopefully make through this. So Mark did an excellent job of setting up what the, the issue was. I'm just gonna try to fill in a few um, facts on this because when the pandemic started, we had designed a, a very comprehensive program both in Saskatchewan and in Ontario with a lot of partners. And one of the things I've observed in my career is when things like this happen, often scientists are 100% committed to other things and they can't respond. So um, as soon as this started to happen, our partners started saying, well, wait a minute, you can't travel, yeah, the labs are closed, and our industry partners, our institutional partners, all started jacking up on us and saying, well, we, we just can't continue. So at that point, Mark and I talked and said, "How we're not just going to sit here for a couple of years because this will take a few years to unfold. What do we do? And so our first call was to Global Water Futures. 
our pillar project is to support technology transfer to institutions, to, to First Nations, to government agencies, to industries, and, and to help the public. So we got in touch with uh, John and he said, do it, uh, go ahead and, and start the change. So we did that. We used some Global Water Futures funding to get started, but then we were able to leverage this funding with additional support. For my lab, that came from the, the Public Health Agency of Canada. And we've had an incredible partnership with them. Uh, both ways, us helping them, them helping us. And it's just been a marvelous experience. So we were in position because of the technology we were developing and because the equipment that Global Water Futures had purchased for us. We had the ability to sequence uh, DNA. We had the ability to work with RNA and we had the mass spectrometers. We had everything in place. Normally, we would not have been able to respond like we did. So to me, it's a big success story and it talks to us being flexible and the management of Global Water Futures being able to, to respond. So we were able to set this up. We here in Saskatoon put together a memorandum of understanding with our wastewater treatment plant through our Office of Emergency Planning. They have been coordinating with the public health in here in Saskatchewan. So we put all that together. We put together a program to help First Nations. Uh, for some of you who may or may not know, a number of our smaller communities don't have active wastewater treatment, but use lagoons, a, a more natural system. Uh, and, and so one of the questions was, could we detect and help those communities? So we put that together through the tribal councils, um, which and, and all of this we did in just a few months. It, it was pretty remarkable what we were able uh, to do. So we had the equipment, we had standard operating procedures, and what that allowed us to do as the pandemic uh, hit was to participate in uh, an effort from the Canadian Water Network, which immediately jumped on this and said, we need techniques, we need standard methods, we provided all of ours to them, and then we participated in a national program. Uh, Mark's lab did too. So we were some of the first labs to jump in what has grown now into a national monitoring network. Um, that led to a second interlaboratory validation program that we also participated in. It allowed us to partner with the uh, NML um, in their programs, uh, I participate, Mark participates in, in all the weekly meetings that are going on with this technology exchange. So for me, it's a big success. We, we've started this technology transfer right from the get-go. It's not a matter of waiting until we've published papers and things like that. It's ongoing at literally every, every week. Um, so we are participating in that. It uh, allowed us now to develop the assays that we're using, but also to move forward looking at variants of interest and variants of concern, which are really the next big issues confronting us uh, here in Canada. The data that we generate goes into public health. Uh, they make decisions based on our data, which is a little bit scary. Uh, recently, based on our data, they made a decision to transfer a uh, vaccine to Saskatoon uh, when it looked like the outbreak in Regina was subsiding and it was just cooking up in Saskatoon. So our data is being used in, in real time. Uh, we put it on a um, dashboard every week and we communicate it to all of the decision makers. So. I just put in a little bit of information here to remind you that this is not the first pandemic. I was actually living in Hong Kong during SARS-1. Uh, so I experienced having to wear the mask every day and teach and everything before. Uh, but there've been a number of pandemics. This wasn't the first and it won't be the last. Um, we had another one earlier in the 20th century that wrecked havoc here in Canada and we're predicting this won't be the last. 
So the idea here is not only to respond to this pandemic, but to put us into position to be able to help in the future. So we, we've had a lot of issues that we've been working on, but we've pivoted our work now to focus on, on this particular issue. So real quickly, um, some background on, on the COVID-19 or the SARS-CoV-2 virus. I wanna make just a couple points here. Uh, one is that this is continually varying. And so we work very closely with Public Health Agency of Canada in monitoring the changes that are occurring with this virus. So as you're probably well aware from the popular press, the issue now is these variants of concern. Um, so one of the key issues is the vaccines that have been developed have focused primarily on something called this spike protein and that makes it very, very specific. But the problem is that's a hot spot for mutations. And so a lot of these viruses that are changing are going to be slightly different. And, and right now there are a lot of open questions, not only relative to infectivity, but also with morbidity and mortality and with resistance based on vaccination. So what we're doing in the Global Water Futures Program is not only running these monitoring programs, but developing techniques using mass spectrometry, using molecular techniques to put us into position to monitor for these variants. And we're actively looking for a, a number of these currently. A little bit slow here. Um, So I'm not going to talk about the details of how we do the monitoring. Um, UI Shi uh, of our group here in Saskatoon is going to walk you through how we do that and how Mark does that and how we use that uh, information. So in conclusion, we think eRNA, so we've pivoted a little bit from our original work with DNA to adapt to do the work with an RNA virus is useful in wastewater-based epidemiology to help us reveal trends. We're working closely with the modeling groups and they're telling us that this information is among the most useful that they have for their predictive models. So we had a lot of high social impact. Uh, we participated in all these national programs We've developed the technology. We're transferring that technology as we go. Uh, we are writing papers. Uh, we're communicating our information to institutions that are using it actively on a daily basis, including five First Nations. So the ultimate goal then is to participate in and develop this nationwide monitoring program for the next pandemic. So with that, I'll stop and let us move on to some of the more detailed talks about how we do this. Thanks, Mark. Hey, great. Uh, and uh, I, I think we're gonna have time at the end. So we're gonna um, save the questions for that point. Um, and so we're gonna move now to uh, Hadi Dehibi and Navetha Shirkanthan, um, who are at the University of Waterloo uh, as part of the group. And so Hadi, Sorry, Mark. There you go. Okay. okay. So thank you, John and Mark. I'll uh, we'll be describing our wastewater SARS-CoV-2 surveillance here in Ontario. I'd like to thank my co-authors as well, uh, especially Nabetha Srikanthan, Patrick Bredner, and Mark Servos, who developed this method over the summer last year. And I'll especially like to thank our regional partners in Peel, Waterloo, and York, especially their wastewater teams and public health teams of these regions. So our wastewater uh, is collected by composite or grab samplers and are collected three to five times a week by the wastewater operators and transported to the University of Waterloo. Uh, once we've received the samples, we uh, 
concentrate them with a PEG sodium chloride precipitation overnight, and then centrifuge them at 12,000 Gs for two hours. And then we uh, discard the supinated and resuspend the pellet that's just shown here. Oh, sorry, I'll just put a pointer in the uh, uh, lysis buffer. We then uh, extract the RNA uh, uh, from the, the, the resuspended pellet using the PA microbiome uh, chitin kit, as well as the trizel chloroform method. We then quantify the RNA uh, using one-step reverse transcription quantitative PCR, and we target the SARS-CoV-2, N1, and N2 regions uh, developed by the US CDC, as well as some other indicators of uh, fecal matter, which we normalize to in the PMMOV. And we run QAQC due to the nature of the samples, and which includes a spike recovery and some inhibition uh, uh, tests using the MHV and 2290, which is a common cold virus. So our three regions of interest are the regions of Waterloo, the regions of Peel to the to the west of Toronto and the region of Europe to the north of Toronto. And as you could see from the Ontario COVID dashboard, the regions of uh, Peel in the pink and York uh, are considered hotspots due to the high numbers of cases uh, reported in these two regions. Whereas Waterloo is a slightly different uh, uh, level of cases, but you still see a peak of the second wave around early January and the third wave is peaking in April uh, in York and uh, Peel regions. So for the region of uh, Peel, the sewer shed is divided into two and it's divided by the Credit River along the middle. And on the east side of the Credit River, you have the GE Booth Wastewater Treatment Plant, which services about 812,000 people and has some input from the York region through the Vaughan uh, the Vaughan uh, entry point at the AMF. And uh, to the west side of the Credit River, you have the Clarkson Wastewater Treatment Plant that services a smaller portion of the, the region with about 588,000 people serviced in, serviced in Clarkson. So jumping right into the data, because it's exciting, we have some uh, data series of, uh, uh, along the bottom. And on one axis, set of axes, you have the reported case numbers as uh, shown in blue columns and the seven day trend line, as well on, as on the opposite axis, you would have the wastewater signal. Uh, here is N gene average copies per mil, and that's signified by the red circles and the seven day trend line with uh, uh, in, the, in red. So some key dates to note is, are these lockdowns and public health measures to help control these waves. And you can see the lockdown in end of November at Peel, the, the province-wide stay-at-home order in uh, the beginning of January, and then the loosening of restrictions in March, and the second stay-at-home order during this period in, uh, in the beginning of April. And we could see here that the, the second wave started uh, to increase in signal in clinical cases and uh, the wastewater signal in early September. And it, go, it follows the trends uh, between the two of the clinical cases as well as the wastewater signal and peaks in early January for both, uh, for both these signals. And once we uh, established some uh, stay-at-home order and we started controlling the wave, we see the, a drop in trends in uh, both the clinical cases and the wastewater signal. And the loosening of restrictions and the beginning of the third wave seems to see an increase in the wastewater signal as well as the clinical case data and peaking in uh, early to mid April. And we, the recent data shows that we, we're, the trend is starting to come down in the PL region for the GE booth wastewater treatment plant. So for the second treatment plant in Peel region, we see similar trends. Uh, the second peak begins a little bit later in, for both clinical cases and the wastewater signal, but we see this peak in uh, early January for, for the second wave and before a drop in uh, case numbers as well as the viral signal. 
and then the beginning of the third wave starting in early March and uh, uh, peaking in mid-April. But we also see this downward trend of the wastewater signal, which is optimistic for the future with controlling this, the third wave. So the York sewer shed is quite different from the Peel region in that it doesn't have a treatment plant. So it pumps its sewage uh, to a neighboring Durham region for treatment at the Duffin Creek wastewater treatment plant here on Lake Ontario. And this covers about 80% of the sewage in the, the York region and the towns of Vaughan, Richmond Hill, Markham, Aurora, and Newmarket. And part of the city of Vaughan gets pumped into the AMF hum, and Humber OCF, which goes down to the GE Booth wastewater treatment plant that I described earlier. And this is an example from uh, our partners at York Region of their dashboard that they're creating. And we can see we pick up from the midpoint of the second wave, and we see this uh, the signal in orange here. It, it, it follows the, the active case count data quite nicely with it peaking in early January before the stay at home order here in January 9th. And we see a drop in trends in both the clinical cases as well as the wastewater signal. And with the loosening of restrictions and the beginning of the second, the third wave, sorry, we see an upward trend between the clinical case data as well as the uh, wastewater signal in, in, the, in the sewers before a, a drop in signal, which is, uh, implies that the wave has over the hump. So in Duffin Creek, which covers about 80% of the York region, we see similar trends with a little bit more variability due to the sampling. Uh, this is a crab sample versus a composite sampler. And we also see, but we see similar trends with the clinical and the wastewater data where there's a rise in the peak of the second wave you know, on January 9th, the first week of January, and then a, a downward trend after that when the stay at home orders have been established. And with the loosening of restrictions and, and, the, and the increase of the third wave, we see this increase in mid-March going up and, and, and peaking in mid-April before a, a, a a downward trend in wastewater and clinical case data. So we stopped sampling in May due to construction at the site. So unfortunately we don't have much information, but there's also these variability in the data. And remember I mentioned that the pepper mild multivirus may be used as a normalizing indicator. So once we, we use that as a PECAL indicator and the normalize the engine signal with a pepper signal, we see that the, this reduces the variability as well as uh, shows that the, the data matches closely with the clinical case data and the bottom graph here. So we, could, we suspect this to be snow melt or uh, increase in flow, which causes this, these unexpected peaks in the waste sewer shed data. So the final two, uh, uh, the final two sites that we have uh, been sampling are the, the Waterloo, and Kitchener Wastewater Treatment Plant, and it uh, services about 120 to uh, 120,000 people in Waterloo and about 250,000 people in Kitchener. And to start off with, the case data is quite low to begin with, but we still see that we could detect the, the tail end of the second wave in early January. And as uh, the, the measures, it seems that the effects of the measures in place by the region seems to curtail the, the effects of the third wave and not so much of a, uh, an increase in case numbers or, and that's supported by the copies per mill in the, the wastewater signal. So this demonstrates the sensitivity of this method in the region, even with low pre prevalence and case data. So in summary, we are able to catch the second and third waves in the Peel and York regions and the tail end of the second wave in the Waterloo region. And this method has been developed as a sensitive technique that detects and quantifies SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater, which is consistent with clinical data cases and is used by regional public health partners to support their interpretation of community trends. So wastewater-based epidemiology is an independent measure of community infection that captures both symptomatic people and asymptomatic people, as well as remove some of the biases described earlier by Mark. Uh, it can be used an, as an effective tool to monitor for future outbreaks, as well as emerging 
emerging variants of concerns, which my, the next speakers will be discussing, and it has potential for monitoring future disease outbreaks, as John has alluded to. So thank you, and if you require more information, please feel free to contact myself, Nabeta, or Mark at the University of Waterloo. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, and so our next uh, speaker is uh, Megan Fuzzin. And Megan is research associate at the University of Waterloo. And she's going to describe um, some of the work that's being done on variants of concern. Thanks, Mark. Okay, so as uh, we've heard just from Hattie, we've just uh, that uh, wastewater is very good at tracing uh, the number of cases of SARS-CoV-2 in a population. I'll be discussing just now how we've been able to trace some uh, one in particular variant of concern in Ontario wastewater. So the term variant of concern is something that just recently came into our, our vocabulary in December when B117 or the UK variant was declared a variant of concern on December 18th by the public health in England. They saw an increase in the spread of cases in Southeast England and they um, traced that to a specific lineage that was B117. So just to kind of define what a variant of concern is, it's when a specific evolution or a lineage of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, can has been um, confirmed to have specific parameters, such as an increase in the transmissibility of the virus, an increase in the virulence of the virus, or a decrease in vaccine effectiveness. There are currently four lineages that are considered as a variant of concern, including B117, uh, B1351, P1 and the, the recently B1617 from India has been classified as a variant of concern by the World Health Organization. So most of the mutations, or actually all of the mutations that have been included as uh, potentially causing, triggering a variant of to be of interest or of concern occur in the spike uh, protein region of these viruses. So they alter how the virus interacts uh, with the human immune system. So the mutation N501Y is common that were classified. So the B117, the B1351, and the P1. And it has been used, at least in Ontario, for screening of clinical cases um, to be further sequenced for determination whether uh, we have clinical cases of variants of concern. Uh, the mutation E484K uh, is also a, what they call a mutation of interest, uh, and it is potentially uh, a, a enabling the virus to escape some of our immune responses. Um, and this mutation is also present, is predominantly present in the B1351 and P1 uh, lineages, but there are some of the B117 cases that have also have this E484K mutation. So I just kind of referred to these uh, variants or mutations of a concern occurring in the spike protein region. Uh, but when we've been looking at the SARS-CoV-2 in the wastewater, we've been targeting the nucleocapsid uh, RNA, since this is, seems to be more stable in the wastewater compared to the spike gene region. So when we were developing uh, assays for variants of concern, we wanted to also focus on uh, mutations specific to these variants of occur concern that were occurring in the nucleocapsid region. So this is uh, from a website, outbreakinfo.com. That's really helpful for us to look for these specific mutations. So here along this row here, we can see all the different variants of either concern or of interest. And then they've highlighted different mutations. These are amino acid mutations that have occurred in the nucleocapsid region. For our first assay that was developed at the University of Ottawa, 
by our partners, Tyson Grabber and Robert Delatola. They focused on the D3L mutation in B117. And that's what I'll be discussing today. Uh, and we can see since it's highlighted in purple here, it is unique to this variant of concern. So making a useful assay. We've been working on assays for other uh, variants of concern. Um, and you can see it's a bit of a, a mixed bag whether these mutations are unique to these specific variants of concern or not. So it can be uh, a bit challenging to pick gene targets. So this is the mutation D3L here. It's actually three uh, nucleotide differences, which is not common. Usually we see only a single nucleotide difference for these amino acid changes. So that we actually got a bit lucky with this mutation, as well as a nucleotide deletion, just another two base pairs upstream. Uh, and this happened to be right next to the N1 amplicon we were already using for screening uh, wastewater for SARS-CoV-2. So Dr. Tyson Grabber designed uh, a new forward primer that extended the N1 assay uh, to an extra 30 base pairs upstream that covered the D3L uh, mutation. Uh, we were able to come in fairly early in his validation process. So we were able to order some um, RNA standards from a company Twist and help him validate this assay and run it in our, in our wastewater samples. So here we're looking at the mutation that we were measuring, the gene copies of the D3LA mutation. And we uh, divided by the total amount of N1 gene copies that we were measuring in the wastewater and reporting that as proportion of the wastewater signal that is a B117 variant. So we we're looking at the data from two regions, the Peel region and the Waterloo region. Uh, and each of these graphs are averaging um, from, from the multiple wastewater treatment plants that we we're observing. There was quite a bit of variability in this data as we saw earlier, and this helped to uh, normalize it a bit. We saw that the emergence of the B117 variant in the wastewater started to pick up in early February in the Peel region. So this is when we first saw the proportion of cases exceed 10%. Uh, in the Waterloo region, this didn't occur till late February, early March. So there was a bit of a delay Similarly, we see the, the peak B17 proportion occurred at 80, about 80% occurred in early April in the Peel region and didn't occur till uh, late April in the Waterloo. So we saw the spread was about three weeks delayed in the Waterloo region. Uh, we decided to go to something we called rapid reporting starting in mid-March, or sorry, early March. Uh, where we, we were processing samples daily and reporting to these various regions daily, uh, including this variant assay. So we were able to provide them some real-time data of how, how this variant was spreading. Uh, and post-analysis, we were able to look at the comparison of the clinical cases to our, to our wastewater assay. And we see that these two measures line up very, very closely. So in the gray, we see the proportion of cases, uh, the clinical cases that uh, detected positive for uh, the N501Y gene. And they are just assumed in, in this data set to be positive for B117. Uh, and the same is true for the wastewater, uh, sort of the Waterloo clinical case data. data. But we do see that they match up quite closely with our assay that's specific for B117 in the wastewater. We also notice that there is this uh, sharp downward trend at the end of the clinical data set. This is due to the lag in reporting of the, the clinical data for that second screen. So after they screen for positive negative of SARS-CoV-2, uh, then they will screen for that N501Y gene. So we were able to actually uh, produce some data um, in advance of the clinical cases. So this leg was occurring all along in the, in the clinical, waste, uh, clinical data set. Uh, so in summary, we were able to help uh, aid with the development of a, an assay that's specific for the B117 variant 
and run it uh, in wrap within a rapid reporting context daily to produce um, information that would help um, not only the regions, but we were reporting to the Ontario science table so they could have additional information when they were making their decisions about which public health measures to take. Uh, and when we used this rapid reporting method, we were able to produce uh, some data that was a little bit ahead of the clinical analyses. So I'd like to say uh, thank you to all of our, our funding and, and partners in the various regions. Thank you very much, Megan. Okay. So we're gonna turn our attention back to uh, Saskatchewan and we're gonna have uh, UI Xi um, discuss um, the results that they're obtaining in um, the Saskatchewan wastewaters. Uh, hello everyone, uh, this is Yui from Yula Waste. Um, I will just give a brief introduction about our case study at Saskatoon regarding the wastewater surveillance of COVID-19. So uh, as introduced by Mark, John, Hedy, and Megan about the application of the wastewater-based monitoring of SARS-CoV-2, I think the wastewater is a convenient sample for monitoring pathogens at a community level. And uh, this application uh, has been ballooned and uh, in the globally and support health authority decision making around the world now. Um, rapid growth of the reported sequence uh, percentages in the public databases indicate that the fast increasing prevalence rates of the variants of concern like B117, P1, and uh, WHO uh, will uh, in this, we, uh, warrant our concern like uh, B1617. Um, while the COVID-19 vaccination is still on the halfway in Canada, so we are still in the race against the COVID-19. And uh, as mentioned by uh, Megan, uh, the emerging VOC and the VOI still have high uh, transmission capability and have potential impact, impact protection of the vaccine-induced antibodies. And uh, uh, this COVID-19 vac uh, vaccine breaks through um, infection are more correlated with uh, those VOCs. So I think uh, Megan already answered the question, can wastewater-based monitoring can save time for the next generation vaccine? So we can use the wastewater-based monitoring to uh, provide data about the uh, wire RNA ratio uh, percentage uh, in, from the whole community to give a brief idea about the pre, uh, prevalence rate of VOCs in a given community. Um, I think there are a few tasks for our wastewater best surveillance. First one is tracking viral RNA singular as an adjunct to clinical testing for assessing the infection rates and, and monitoring the RNA or global variant of concern. And the, the last one is how to compare the magnitude of outbreaking by westward based data between committees. So there are still a few challenges regarding the unstable supply chain and the timely um, uh, for the method development. And we are using the pool uh, of virus RNA uh, from the westward sample and uh, it's challenging for um, for method developing than the clinical uh, samples. And we also need to think about the single noise ratio and the dilute uh, effect of the uh, wire types for the VOC detection. And there's still a lack of comparison between the viral and chemical indicators uh, for population size modulation uh, for our task. Uh, I think Megan already, uh, 
this table listed uh, discriminated mutation sites for uh, detection uh, orions. So all the sites highlighting red are used for our uh, mutation um, detection um, panel and targeting B17, and B1351, and P1, we will see. And we are still uh, developing other uh, methods uh, for, uh, for this task. Um, population normalization is, a, is an essential um, a component to convert population-wide load of pathogens to epidemiological uh, parameters of uh, community health. So for example, uh, for instance, the, the the prevalence rate of a, a disease in a given community. Uh, currently, there are few indicators and biomarkers for population size normalization. For instance, the census data, the wastewater parameters, and uh, uh, biomarkers like the creatinine um, metabolites uh, of the creatine and uh, uh, artificial sweetener from and the papyrus from dietary and also some viral uh, in uh, fecal specific viral indicators like the F specific RNA bacteria phage of subgroup two. Uh, thanks to the uh, West was surveillance um, initial, um, network, we learn a lot um, to optimize our method and we, uh, the current pipeline we developed we, uh, for different uh, to uh, rise end users, first lessons, uh, municipal wastewater plant, and to deal with different uh, type of wastewater, the raw sewage, um, primary, uh, the raw influent, primary influent, and the primary effluent, depending on uh, if there is a uh, 24 hours composite available uh, in the wastewater plant uh, for the Lagoon, the natural uh, treatment, um, um, treatment uh, for the first lessons, we just using the raw sewage uh, sam uh, samples for our detection. And we also introduce multiple uh, standard material to estimate the recovery ratio of the whole process and uh, the extraction, RNA extraction efficiency and uh, uh, the PCR inhibition. Um, for uh, the VOC detection, we sent uh, samples to National Microbiology Lab uh, for, uh, to run the whole genome sequencing to confirm screened uh, warrant our concerns. Uh, the present uh, data are co was conducted in Saskatoon, all samples from Saskatoon Westwood Treatment Plant. Um, this figures uh, present the viral RNA uh, load of SARS-CoV-2 in the wastewater in Saskatoon, uh, from Saskatoon. And we can see uh, in last um, October and uh, December, we can see a huge uh, spike of the viral load in wastewater and, uh, uh, and followed by the spike of the new cases and reported, reported new cases and, and uh, the five day moving average of active cases. And we, and uh, the profile of the viral load in wastewater is parallel uh, with the trend of the uh, clinical uh, reported um, new cases uh, where in the December and uh, January and February. There's a gap in uh, in the later January and February because the daytime uh, the downtime of high speed centrifuge. So um, unfortunately, there's a gap for uh, for our monitoring program. And recently, there's a huge spike uh, appeared in the uh, in the mid April, and uh, but uh, the the spike of the active cases. Uh, in, increase um, before and after this spike. There's 
be some uh, there should be some uh, variants of the our data uh, be introduced by uh, the westward by technique or the bios of the reported clinical data um, And based on uh, statistically, um, the wire load in Westward is significantly correlated with the reported active cases and numbers and uh, new case, lum case numbers. Uh, we applied um, the method developed by uh, Megan and the University of uh, Ottawa uh, using the same strategy to, de to detect the the screen, the wire RNA of B117 from the wastewater within the same uh, D3R site to, uh, for, our test, for our test. So the percentage of the screen wire RNA uh, fragment of the B117 lineage increased rapidly in the, uh, from early uh, April and uh, the peak appeared at, at mid April, um, which suggests uh, the recent outbreaking mostly caused by the B117 uh, lineage. And the whole genome sequencing uh, conducted uh, supported by a national microbiology lab confirmed the dominant lineage circulating at Saskatoon is B117 currently. There is one uh, down, uh, downtrend at the end of the April. Um, it may be ca caused by a uh, multiple lineage uh, circulating as in Saskatoon, and we got some confirmed cases, clinical cases uh, for effect with um, P1 and uh, B1351 and uh, the, the emerging uh, uh, India B1617 B1, uh, uh, lineages. We also compared um, chemical and viral um, indicators for population size uh, normalization. Um, from September, last September to April, the acelfen, the artificial sweetener, is more stable than uh, the log 10 transformed pepper virus and then the creatinine. Um, however, the seasonal change of the, those indicators is, are still on the uh, monitoring. So hopefully we can have a co more complete data to give a whole aspect of the performance of the, all these chemical and uh, uh, viral indicators. But based on the current data in hand, uh, I think the ACF firm is maybe help, maybe useful for long, uh, population size norm uh, normalization or as a control to check if there's a flood or, or effect from the slow melting uh, in spring. Um, all techniques have their own limitations. Um, for the westward based surveillance, I think the decent decentralized westward system will not be captured from uh, from the sample from the westward uh, treatment plant, and uh, it makes us to to consider our data uh, carefully to match the case numbers back to the serial sheet rather than the uh, admittive region. And the negative results um, do not indicate absence of cases. It's limited by the sensitivity of our technique. And the low incidence may be below the limit of detection. And uh, the wire should, in, uh, should by people may be impacted by the pre-treatment of sewage for order or work safety, as it were, as and there also as uh, some environmental factors can uh, uh, have some uh, their effects on the uh, fate of the virus in the wastewater, such like uh, the UV and heat. Um, brief con conclusion: So the ER-based wastewater, uh, uh, the wastewater-based surveillance is, uh, can re reveal the trend in the viral commit. Uh, <clears throat> community transmission in real time and presents the takeover progress of the B17 lineage in Saskatoon. And ACCFM is more stable than uh, creatinine, um, maybe useful for the population size normalization. Um, thanks a lot for uh, GWF and uh, 
um, Pihad for supporting us to run this program, and thanks a lot for the city of Saskatoon. And Saskatoon West will should plan to provide samples to do to finish uh, our monitoring program. Uh, that's all. Thanks so much. Thanks, UI. So, um, so we're, we're fortunate to have our last speaker is um, Chan Mengat, and he is a scientist with the National Microbiology Laboratory of the Public Health Agency of Canada. And we've had the privilege of working with Chan for the last uh, eight months to a year. Um, he's become a leader um, in this field of wastewater epidemiology. He um, chairs uh, weekly meetings. He's involved in uh, all sorts of things. And he has uh, demonstrated how important collaboration and being open with our science is to be able to address a really critical uh, public health issue. So I'd like uh, Chant to uh, take over. Great, thanks, Mark. Um, so, so I'm, I'm Chand, I'm a research scientist at the Public Health Agency of Canada, um, head of wastewater surveillance in the wastewater and antimicrobial resistance division, we're a new unit um, at the Public Health Agency of Canada. And, and I think that really um, speaks to um, facts, um, confidence in, in the usefulness of wastewater-based epidemiology for um, you know, public health action. So I'm going to um, talk to you today about just generally at the federal um, national level, what's going on with wastewater surveillance and how we see it, it fits into our current mandate. Um, so here's my, my title slide. We've been working, you know, closely with the government of the Northwest Territories um, and, and John's group in uh, University of Saskatchewan have been um, fantastic partners in this. And so I'd like to thank him and, and, and Mark um, for inviting me today to talk uh, about wastewater-based epidemiology from the FAC uh, perspective. Um, so, sorry, see. Chan, uh, you need to switch to display settings, the presenter screens. Oh yeah, okay, where do I find that? It's uh, under display settings. Yeah, it shows me that I'm sharing it. Um, does that it's work? a second screen. Oh. Second screen. Yeah, it shows me I'm in presenter mode, but I'm not, maybe I'm not sharing it properly. Let me just bring it over to this side. Sometimes happens when you have two screens. Yeah. Is this, is this better? Yeah, and just click, yep. Uh -oh. oh, it. I, I think it's fine unless uh, we, we can see your notes. Oh yeah, there's no notes. Yeah, okay. I, I can, maybe if I move this over here. Uh, we'll go with it, yeah. <laughs> okay. Luckily, I, I got nice big icons for you so you, you, you all can see what's going on. Uh, so, so, you know, wastewater itself is a tremendous opportunity. It represents, you know, the health of an entire community, and, and that's what we're interested uh, at FAC. Um, and, and I think the other opportunity it presents is to be more proactive in our application uh, of, of public health responses. So, so just as an overview, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, you know, facts perspective and its alignment uh, of our mandate with, with wastewater-based epidemiology and, and successes at multiple scales and some of our national work, that, uh, national coordination that we're uh, uh, applying to, to, to WBE. So um, this is just a slice of the fact mandate, um, but broadly it's to promote health, prevent chronic diseases, uh, prevent and control infectious disease and prepare and respond to public health emergencies. And so, so we think WBE um, can be applied across all of these um, um, goals. Um, so, so particularly the way we see it is that uh, WBE um, can provide trends and early warning to the incidence of diseases. And I think that, that um, We've seen some great work out of Waterloo and, and Saskatchewan today um, um, exhibiting that. And, and uh, I think secondly, 
um, it's an equitable application of public health resources. So it doesn't matter if you're able or unable to present for testing, if you're symptomatic or asymptomatic. And, and so we think it's particularly useful in, in remote communities, communities that have low clinical surveillance sensitivity. Um, and you know, one of the hardest things is to, is to monitor um, um, populations at scale. And, and that's what wastewater epidemiology really uh, allows us to do. Um, so it's broadly applicable to, to a wide range of infectious diseases. And I think that's, that's why we've, we've, one of the reasons anyway, that, that we've um, invested so heavily in it. Um, you know, well-established for enteric diseases and polio, a number of um, um, international studies for AMR and, and it's used in nationally anyway for, for some illicit um, drug use um, monitoring for, from a public health perspective. So, so this is just a look at what's going on nationally as far as major surveillance networks. So, so my apologies, there are um, groups that have might be looking at our community or two, and, and so they're omitted just for clarity, but, but these are large networks. And across them all, we have some 60% population coverage. Um, from the federal perspective where I sit, right? So we um, uh, monitor some 29 sites. Um, and so that's in collaboration with, with a number of, of federal agencies and academic partners, uh, particularly um, John who's on the call. Um, and um, so large networks in Alberta, Ontario, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Quebec. Ontario has been um, one of the leaders as they've invested heavily some $12 million. And I think out of that network, or even I'd say establishing that network, Mark's group was important in giving folks confidence that that, that was a, a money well spent. So, so this is just an idealized look at a wastewater collection network just to, um, uh, I think underscore the, the usefulness, the multiple scales that, that wastewater surveillance is useful, right? And so starting on the left, we have, let's say the point of introduction of your public health concern, SARS at the toilet. And, and so we can use that um, immediacy uh, of that sort of sampling at the utility hole um, to now, if you know, we idealize now the wastewater collection network here in this map, um, maybe here is where I should say, um, uh, we, we can do surveillance at things like institutions um, where I would say the pandemic has been, um, uh, taken a big toll, right, on, on long-term care facilities and, and, and prisons and the like. And so here's just some of our data from that work. So on the X is, is time, on the Y is viral load, um, a period of low incidence, and then a, a sudden surge in wastewater signal. Um, which uh, foreshadows um, an eventual clinical test positive. So, so a couple of um, uh, employees at that institution actually were reporting to work sick. And so we had a clear seven day forewarning on that um, introduction into that community. Um, further down the network, there are um, structures um, such as lift stations um, or equalization tanks, you know, beating hearts, um, essential parts of the wastewater collection infrastructure. They allow us to now sample a, lighter swath, a wider swath of the community. Um, so this is just a look at some of the work um, we were involved in with the government of the Northwest Territories, similar trace. Um, and so we can now um, uh, stratify signals uh, based on whether they were anticipated or unanticipated because of uh, the close relationship with the NWT and their clinical surveillance team. Some signals make sense. People are returning to the territory or quarantining. These are anticipated um, viral signals. Unanticipated signals have no explanation. In this case, this signal motivated public health um, to put out a public health advisory, which um, was essentially to do enhanced testing, which yielded five um, new cases. And so, um, I, I, I think end to end, this is one of the highest applications of wastewater based epidemiology that I think um, yielded clear results and, and the NWT has been um, well ahead in, in, in closing the loop on wastewater data. Um, so you've seen, I think from the endpoint um, work, um, you know, from, from Mark and, and John's group on, on how to apply it, I guess, at the city level. Um, so, so I won't speak to that. Um, at the agency, one of our roles is, is national coordination. So we've been happy to work with um, the Canadian Water Network and, and others in, in setting up inter-laboratory studies of methods. Um, John and Mark were critical to the first round. I think firstly in, in getting 
public health some degree of confidence in the work and, and also informing um, nationally the methodologists and furthering the, the, the technology. And, and so the first round, I think the lesson learned was that uh, viral surrogates um, weren't uh, were inadequate, I think, in, in developing tests. And I think also there was some light at the end of the tunnel that, that many groups could have um, similar performance. Um, the second round was a collaboration with the Ministry of the Environment in Ontario and the Clean Water Agency there. And uh, uh, one of the largest studies of its kind, um, um, fantastic work by, by Dr. Alex Chick at Aqua. Um, and and uh, I, you know, those lessons are to come, but I, I think we, we have more clarity on methodology and, and test performance across various um, analytic schemes. So, so where can this go? Just from a fact perspective, one of the things we do is respond to outbreaks. And this is just scenes from one of our recent engagements prior to COVID in the high north in Nunavut um, to help control a TB outbreak. And so, you know, the, the scene could be Ebola in Africa or, or HIV in Africa or, or Pakistan, um, where um, we're asked to, to, to respond, right, to, to a public health emergency and, and those emergencies, um, one of the first things you need to do is have, you know, uh, situational awareness. And so we think, you know, wastewater epidemiology is fantastic for that, going into a new setting, quickly assessing um, what's happening in, not at ground zero, but even you know, further afield um, and, 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 and um, drawing up priorities based on that information. Um, I think secondly, um, you know, there, there are a number of, 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 of places around the world that, that are just a plane ride away from Canada. Their clinical sensitivities are, are certainly not as high as it is in Canada, so if we can apply wastewater surveillance to those locales uh, in conjunction with, with some of the variant testing that the groups in, in, in the country have been developing, um, it could be a tremendous asset for, for uh, public health response. So, so what is FACT doing? Um, generally, we're um, fostering information exchange, as, as Mark had said, over, over three major calls weekly. Um, and, and John and Mark's group have been great participants there. Uh, improving methodology, as I said, by um, uh, participating in interlaboratory studies and, and helping coordinate them. Um, but also, we, we offer split sample testing um, to any group that would like and, and give some sense of um, um, maybe a sanity check on what they're seeing in their communities. Uh, we expand um, our pilot sites, particularly to fact priority populations. So that's remote um, and indigenous communities, um, DND sites, places like that. Um, we've built um, a mobile test we think we can deploy. Um, and hopefully you'll all hear about that later, but something, a test that you can take right to the, 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 the point of poop, as we say, and, and, and uh, uh, get a, an accurate understanding of what's happening as far as viral loads. Um, we support um, a, a, a consolidation of data nationally through the ODM data model. So that's just a, a common um, nomenclature for wastewater-based data that's being led by um, Doug Manuel at the University of Ottawa. Um, and, and we also support uh, mechanistic um, modeling and, and the University of S Saskatchewan and Nathaniel Osgood, Osgood have, been, have been leaders in that respect. And, and finally, um, variant analysis and testing. So um, this is where I end. Um, so this is a, uh, a wastewater treatment lagoon in the far north. And you know, I just wanna say that Canada is a geographically diverse uh, uh, community, uh, uh, nation. Uh, we are spread out um, uh, you know, quite far. W Winnipeg is one of the you know, most isolated cities in the, in, the, in, the, in the world really. And so um, we're a resource-based economy and the reason we're so spread out is because that's where a lot of our businesses, we have a lot of remote communities that need protection. And so wastewater-based epidemiology, wastewater testing is I think uh, a tremendous asset to, to, to deal with um, uh, healthcare and public health concerns in, in a nation like Canada. So just some final thoughts, just you know, with, with, with a, a view to the, the, the audience here, uh, people who are accustomed to looking in, in sewer sheds and what are the expertise we think that you can bring um, that the fact doesn't have, right? And, and I would say one is hydrological modeling. That's not something we're accustomed to. We, we have models of, you know, sensitive, infected and, and resistant folks. Um, and there isn't this idea that um, the signal precision depends on where you sampled, right? Um, 
so so this idea of origin transport transformation and fate of 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 analytes through um, a, a wastewater collection system is, isn't something we're well equipped to handle. We don't typically at the laboratory level do tremendous geospatial analysis. That's something I think that, that this community is really good at. Um, we can't account for dynamic populations because that's not something we we think about. Um, typically, what but, but, um, is applied by folks like uh, UA today. Um, we don't deal typically with dilute or uh, matrices. Um, so some of the uh, parasite testing or, or, or heavy metal testing that you guys are, are accustomed to doing, that's not something that we have much expertise in. And I think remote sensing is, is a big part of um, getting this to work at scale. So I think what excites us is that it's a common matrix useful to many stakeholders. Um, I, I think there's samples that, that we'll be taking for this program that will be could be transformative across a number of program areas. And, and we, we certainly love the interdisciplinary nature of the work. I, I don't think I would have ever, outside of the COVID-19 pandemic, met Mark or, or worked with John. Um, and, and so it's just been great, um, all the cross-pollination. And, and I think I'll just end with, it's probably what brought me to science was, was, was ecology and, and looking at um, coral reefs on TV, right? And, and, and then you know, you kind of move away from that and that now um, get to work again uh, across a number of disciplines. So I'll end it there. Uh, lots of people to thank and, and not enough time. So that's it. Thank you, Chen. So we have a, a, a few minutes left for um, questions. Uh, we covered an awful lot of material. Um, I would reiterate that from Chan's point of view that this has definitely been um, one of the most challenging projects and things that we've done, but it's been one of the most collaborative and open science forums that I've experienced in my career. Um, and the people involved have been uh, spectacular in every respect. Um, so Chen, from your perspective, from national uh, viewpoint, uh, we've been through three different waves now. Um, do, you, do you think that uh, we're having a real impact? Um, we, we working, it's difficult to get public health to um, accept that poop is, is important, but I think we're getting, starting to, to have an impact in certain places. Can do you? Yeah, I, I think that was a big part of, uh, of what we're doing now. It, it is, is, is that public health engagement piece. And it's not even across the country, right? S some health units are, are, have taken it up wholesale, right? What the wastewater is telling them because they, they trust the data, right? And, and I think, um, you know, we, we've had a number of calls with la laboratory networks in Canada and, and they're just so busy, right? And, and they, they just need those, uh, they need to trust the results. Um, they need them digested, uh, and they need them in a way that it makes sense to them. They need the data presented, and and, and so I, I, we worked a lot on methodology. And, and now I think the second piece, and, and you guys have led the way as well, is how do you talk to those public health people so that they can trust the data? And and so it is making an impact, um, but not evenly across the nation, is what I would say. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're going to have our 40th weekly meeting with some of our partners. <laughs> and so you get to know people when, uh, you know, you have wastewater operators and wastewater managers and public health and epidemiologists all on the calls. And you know you're having an impact when all of them show up every week for every meeting. Um, and they're taking that data and posting it on their websites. They're posting it in their epi reports and they're taking it uh, into meetings. Uh, and, and it's a supportive tool that helps in this pandemic to understand what's going on. Yeah, but my feeling is if, if people strictly with, with discipline followed what wastewater was telling them, I, uh, I think it'd have a, a much greater impact in my opinion. You know, it, 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 it seems to me it's always reflective of the truth. Very few times is there, is, is there a lot of conflict there. And if we don't take the time now, then it isn't a resource that will be available to us for the fourth wave, the next decade's pandemic or the next century's pandemic. So we really have to um, take the opportunity now and learn as much as we can. Yeah. And John, do you have any comment? Uh, just 
One, you know, in our name, Global Water Futures, we're trying to look to the future, but scientists in general tend to work on what they're familiar with. I think this pandemic really forced us to have the courage to look to something new. And then the group came together. And, and like you mentioned, Chan mentioned, to me, it's been one of the best experiences of my life as far as the science. Everybody has been so super communicative, open, transparent, sharing. It's, it's just been marvelous. To me, it's what global water futures should be about. So I'm really pleased that we had the opportunity and that our management had the foresight to say, go for it. So thanks everybody, marvelous job. I really enjoyed the session. Thanks, Mark. Thanks again, Chan. Well, I, I think on that note, um, I think uh, perhaps uh, we're at the end of the time that's allocated to us. And I wanna thank all of the speakers that participated today at Global Water Futures for their really critical role in making this work possible. And uh, for all of the, the speakers and the people that participated today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.